Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Live Your Spa Life Show. Spa life is a lifestyle that accepts that accomplishment and harmony coexist. The spa and spa life, the SPA, is for seek power always. That power within you to do your deeper work in the world. I am so deeply honored to have Dr. Nino Kubin serving as president of High Point as a guest on our show. He has increased enrollment by 245%, grown net assets from 56 million to almost a billion dollars, created six new academic schools, and attracted 500 million in philanthropic investments. Kuben has led HBO's enrollment this year to a record-breaking 5,600 students, even in the midst in the nation's COVID-19 challenges. HPU's total enrollment grew by 5.6%. HPU's graduate programs now enroll 1,000 students. Prior to his role at HPU president, Dr. Kuben rose to prominence as an internationally known author and consultant who has given 7,500 presentations worldwide. Dr. Quibain, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. What a pleasure for me to be with you. Well, I love that uh, you are here. You have such a, a beautiful, rich uh, background that you come from. And one of the things that our listeners like to hear is they see someone who has been successful and they think that it was easy. You were born into it or it just kind of came to your fingertips. And along that path, there are things that can be disempowering uh, that lead you to be into the empowered place that you're in. Can you share a little bit about your story and uh, your road to where you are? Well, look, Diane, you know, life can be difficult, I know, but uh, there's no such thing as unrealistic dreams, only unrealistic timelines. Here's my story in brief. My daddy died when I was six years of age. I'm often asked if I could have changed one thing in my life, what would that have been? And the answer is as clear to me as a sunny sky on a beautiful day. I would have much rather have had a dad. A dad would have read me a book, sang me a song, take me to the circus, uh, you know, played frisbee with me, but that was not my fate. I discovered in my life much later on that out of adversity can emerge abundance. I call it now faithful courage. You know, you take your faith, you take your courage, put them together, you have faithful courage. And with faithful courage, you really can move mountains. And so my mama, who had um, fourth grade education, uh, became my number one hero, model, mentor. Uh, my mother had this graduate degree in something you and I might call uncommon sense. She instilled in me values for life and principles for living that have served me so well all these many years and that now I reflect upon almost daily. For example, she would say, who you spend time with is who you become. In other words, the circle of influence in which you reside will determine the person you become. She would say, what you choose is what you get. The circumstances in which you find yourself today do not define where you end up. They only, they only define where you start. And then she would say, how you succeed, not if you succeed, not when you succeed, but how you succeed. In other words, with integrity, and relational capital and service to humankind is how you will change and how you'll transform yourself. So my, you know, I, I, my daddy was, you know, died when I was six. That was a turning point, Diane. I came to America at age 17, big turning point. No money, hardly any English, no connections. Are you kidding? This is back in the late sixties. We didn't have FaceTime. We didn't have iPhones, you know, you had to write a letter, you know, to your mom 7,000 miles away and it takes a week to get there and a week for her to write me back. And uh, you know, I went to graduate school and came out of graduate school and started my first business with $500, all the money in the world that I had. So that's, that's where, where I came from. I never worked for anybody. I, I never had a paycheck until I came to this university, they gave me a paycheck. I couldn't believe what that was. I, I did, you know, the guy came in, Diane, and he brought this envelope with a window in it. And, and I said, what is that? He said, that's your paycheck for the month of January. I said, this is cool. You know, I was in a business where if you made money, you paid your expenses and kept the rest, right? If you didn't make any money, you may have to go to your savings and kind of bring some money and put it in the business. And then Diane, in February, 
you're not going to believe this. The same dude showed up again with another <laughs> envelope in a window in it. I said, what's that? He said, your paycheck. I said, you've already given me one. Here it is on my desk. And, and so it is. I'm being a little silly, but I think you get the idea. I love it. And I love that you have so many uh, lessons from your mother, particularly about taking risk. And you talk about in terms of risk is that if you take the risk out of life, you take the opportunity out of life. And especially now when there's just so much happening in the world and so much chaos, and you talk about having, uh, having focus and how important that is. In a distracting world, how is it that you keep uh, yourself and your students focused on the important things? Well, look, focus is more important than intelligence and risk is not a big deal. You know, it's not about risk avoidance. It's about risk management. And so anything I'm ever involved in, I started half a dozen businesses. I, I sold some of them, kept some of them. I've been in lots of investments and so on. When I came to High Point, we turned things upside down. We invested $2 billion in the school. By the way, this is my undergraduate alma mater and is located in the city in which I reside. So I came here thinking I'll be here two years and 16 years later, here I am and we are profoundly successful. But more important than that, we are transforming uh, the, the lives of thousands of students who enter the hall of the hallways to learn and who exit to make their life truly extraordinary. After all, extraordinary is a choice. And so, you know, um, the reality of it is that uh, you have to focus on the things that are important to you and you have to manage your risks. Incidentally, Diane, I ask myself three questions before I make any big decision. What is the most likely thing to happen as a result of taking this decision? Let's say you're gonna buy an office building uh, and you say, what's the most likely thing to happen or what's the best thing to happen? Those are the two most important questions. What is the best thing to happen? might happen, what is the thing that's most likely to happen and what is the worst thing that can happen? And the way I make a decision is if the most likely thing will get me closer to my goals, and if I'm willing to deal with the worst thing that can happen, I go for it. I go for it with gusto. But if the most likely thing doesn't get me closer to my goals, what in the heck am I doing this for? And if I'm not willing to deal with the worst thing that can happen, I would never bet the farm on every decision I make. That's just not my nature. So while people observing from outside think I'm taking so many risks and, and you know, I'm a big thinker and I think in, the, in big ways, what they don't know is I get up every morning between three o'clock and four o'clock and I work for two to three hours. I study, I diagnose, I dissect, I discuss with myself. I have moments of just quiet where I just, I just get myself centered. And by the time I come to work, I have pages of notes or tons of stuff in my iPhone under notes saying, do this, do that, go here, do that. And so um, every person I've ever met, every person, I, I'm privileged to be a member of the Horatio Alger Association, Distinguished Americans, eight new members come every year. Oprah is one, Colin Powell is one, Howard Schultz, uh, you know, uh, Starbucks guy is one. Uh, you get the idea. These are big time people. Many of them are multi-billionaires, by the way. I'm by far the poorest guy there, which gives me hope because I can still, I can still achieve things. And so um, what, what I've learned though is that you have to take risks, calculated risks, and you have to focus on a few really important things. You must know the difference between the urgent and the important. You must know the difference between time management and energy management. Because if you don't know these things, you'll work 23 hours every single day and you wake up one day and say, I'm a great time manager. I've really worked hard. How come I haven't achieved anything? Or I was successful in this business and I lost it all in this business. Well, these are, forgive me, but in my book, these are inexcusable. Um, inexcusable reasons to give for one success or failure. Look, in life, there are non-productive successes. You succeed, you don't know why you succeeded, therefore you cannot replicate it. And there are productive failures. You fail, you analyze, diagnose, and you learn from it. And so I'm a student, you know, school is never out for the pro. So I'm an absolute student of everything I do, I'm gonna do it with excellence. And on the other hand, I'm a free spirit, you know, so 
I'm willing to um, put my neck on the line like I'm doing with you today. Ask me anything you want to ask me. I don't have any preparation. I don't have any notes. This is my office, Diane. See, you only see about, you're seeing about 20% of my office. I have a beautiful office. Do you know why? And it's all windows because I get up every morning, I shave, I shower, I put on a clean shirt. It makes me feel good. And when I come to my office, the surrounding prescribe quite often, not exactly how I feel, you know, the feelings come from within for all kinds of reasons, but it helps. So even the Mona Lisa, Diane, even the Mona Lisa in the Louvre is framed beautifully and lit perfectly. And if you take the frame away and the lights away and throw the Mona Lisa in the corner, maybe only the most learned people in art appreciation would know what it is and admire it. And so that's true of you and me. That's true of our life. Right. I love that. And, you know, you talk about being focused, but you also have such a variety of things that you are passionate about, uh, especially in business. And for, for those who may not know, you serve on some corporate boards, um, Fortune 500 companies, including Truist, Lazy Boy, InThrive, and Healthcare. And you're also the executive chairman on the Great Harvest Bread Company. On the outset, you can see, wow, there's like banking and bread and furniture, like those seem such variety of things. How is it that you choose to have those as your focus uh, and continue on with everything you want to do at the university? Yeah, so Diane, that's, so far that's your best question, Diane. <laughs> that's a really good question because what happens to innovative, creative people like you and me and many of your, of your viewers and listeners is that if we're not careful, we, we are divided in so many directions and we lack intentional congruence. My life is about intentional congruence. It's about making sure that all that I am and all that I believe and all that I do leads to congruence, leads to the whole. So I'm not in pursuit of money, for example, never have been. I've always had lots of money come my way, but I never get up in the morning saying, how do I go out there and make more money? I get up every morning and say, how do I create appreciated value in others? Now, Diane, there's a big difference between value. Everybody renders value. If you don't render value, uh, society will, will dismiss you very quickly. Nobody will do business with you. The key is not value. That's a given. That's a prerequisite. Well, it's just like a university must have great academic programs, but that's not enough. So you must create appreciated value. In other words, the person who buys your service must feel that what you're rendering uh, fulfills their goals, meets their needs, perhaps overcomes their fear, uh, you know, brings them uh, some of their aspirational views of life. And so for me, let's go back over that list. So I wanted to know a lot about retail. So I bought a company called Great Harvest, 240 stores around the country. And I was also very invested in a company called Dots, women's clothing. Dots didn't do well. The recession came in, it was busted. Great Harvest went through the roof. So that is something I call hedging. You cannot merely diversify, you must hedge. I depended all my life on my voice uh, and my brain uh, to build businesses, especially speaking. And I was a professional speaker for many, many years. I've given 7,500 presentations all over the world, commanded very high fees. I then did consulting where the minimum entry level of my consulting was a million dollars a year. Some companies paid me as much as 10 million and so on. But it all depended on my speaking. And I thought, what if I ever lost that? And so I wanted to build other revenues, other streams of income that are not dependent on my primary um, resource that I use in my business. So that's why I became interested in, in retail. and did very well there. Uh, I was interested in banking. I'm very interested in finance. So, and I'm pretty good at it. Have you noticed that things that you're really interested in, you have a tendency to become good at? And so a couple of guys and I started a bank in 1985. And I put all the money I had at the time in my Keo account. That's like an IRA account. I put it in this bank. I bought stock. And three years later, we sold the bank and I got onto the bigger banks board and I survived three mergers of equals every time they picked me 
as, as one of the few to make the merged board. Today, of course, Truist has 60,000 employees, $480 billion in assets, and a footprint that goes across, uh, across America. I'm the longest serving director on that board, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, I'm on the board of Lazy Boy because I'm interested in furniture because I live in the home furnishings capital of the world, right here, Highport, North Carolina. But, but Diane, look, don't dismiss the fact I've also said no many times. Mm -hmm. It is more important when I would interview somebody or I would coach an executive, I would say, list for me the five opportunities you said no to. Not the ones you said yes to, the ones you said no to. And why? Because that will tell me more about the way you think than anything else. So here's an opportunity. So I'm giving you a, you know, a diamond and you go, no, tell me about that. So that's where my brain is. And, and, um, and ironically, Diane, I left the most incredibly successful career, you know, frankly, making huge sums of money and, and really not having a big responsibility because when you coach, when you speak, you do your very best, but you can also walk away from it. And I came to my alma mater, which was this big and $28 million in revenue, was not doing well at all and had 18 buildings. Today, we have 128 buildings, invested $2 billion, quadrupled the number of students, uh, took academic buildings, as you said, in the intro from three to nine. Hopefully your listeners understand what I just said. You don't do that easily. You don't begin doctoral programs and healthcare and so on by just, you know, flipping a switch, but we did it and we built our brand. And one of the main things we did is we said, it's not enough to get a great academic education. You must be armed with life skills. If you graduate from college and you're not armed with life skills, you're not educated. You're merely trained. And so the way I'm talking with you is the way I speak. And um, I, I'm, I'm a straight shooter. I tell you what I think in a very respectful way. But I understand that my greatest gift is that I'm a diagonal thinker. I'm not a horizontal thinker, although I do, I do see things horizontally. And I'm not just a vertical thinker. I can connect both. So I tend to see things from a 360 perspective. I've learned. I, I didn't always know this about me. Uh, in a way that's not very common. And so I can think about a project, an idea. I can meet with people about the biggest things. It, it's not really intelligence. It's not, we're not talking IQ here. We're talking um, a developed trait that turn to, turns into a skill that turns into um, strategic planning that turns into execution. Have you noticed, Diane, you ask me a question with 15 words and I give you a book back in return? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm just. No, it's perfectly uh, fine. You know, it's one of the things that, that I love is that you definitely in, embody the, the science and art and it can really flow in between all of those. With students, you know, that is something that comes up around higher education is that, you know, they can memorize things and they can get things out there, but where's the common sense? And in terms of being able to teach that, you know, can you talk a little bit more about like what is life skills and why is that so important for our young people? Yeah, because Diane, look, um, young people are different than, than you, me, the next person. I mean, students in college, but they're not different. We're all human beings. We all have um, similar fears and goals and needs and aspirations and so on. So when I came here as president, I didn't say, oh, these are kids, you know, entering the school. Whoa, whoa, whoa. These are young men and women that their parents are putting them in the school and paying large fees because they want them to evolve into somebody who can then charge forth with a spirited energy that says, I am enough, but I can always become better. I'm enough as is, I can make in this world, but I can always grow. And the question is, how do you grow? In what dimension do you grow? Why are you growing in that dimension? As Viktor Frankl said to all of us in his book, In Search of Meaning, if you know your why, you'll always figure out the how. You know, someone, someone, who knows, uh, someone who knows what to do, they know their how, but someone who knows how to be, they know their why. I'm not trying to be philosophical. I'm just trying to say that, that each of us has a responsibility, has a duty, has a calling. 
to become the best that we can become. It has nothing to do with greed. By the way, if you have more money, you can do more good in this world. Sure, you can do good without having money. I know that with your time, with your contributions, with your volunteering. But if you have money, you can do a lot of good. You can, you can help people who may be poor and you can help students go to school. And you can help communities and so on. So at High Point University, when I came here, I brought with me what I have taught for 30 plus years. Millions of people have attended my seminars and paid fees, and read my books and listened to my CDs and all of that. And I said, I wonder if that would work on a college campus. And I brought it here. And I didn't second guess myself. I start speaking like I'm speaking with you today. And I found that the world is hungry for that. And I also found out that colleges are not used to that. So for some people, it took them a little while to get acclimated with my approach. But as we became more and more successful, people also acknowledge this works. And I said, for example, that every student should graduate with an arsenal of life skills. And that includes everything from how to think, not what to think, but how to think, to fiscal literacy, how to make money, how to save it, how to invest it, how to share it, uh, to leadership, to stewardship, to communication skills, to presentation skills. So I put together this, this class, which I teach to all the freshmen at Hype University. In fact, you can't graduate from here unless you take my class. So one hour class is the most favorite class on campus. Why? Because there are no exams. You just have to write a paper for it. And there's no grades, it's pass or fail. The intent of the class is not to be academic. The intent of the class is to say, hey guys, I came to this country 17 years of age. Could hardly speak the language, which I speak today in a fluid flowing um, uh, uh, manner. And I made it. I made it. What about you? What would keep you from climbing the highest mountain? And I'm going to show you some ideas here in your freshman year, first semester on campus that can help your long life. And so, so 1,500 freshmen take my class, 750 at a time. You can throw a paper napkin on the carpeted floor and hear it hit the floor in part because I'm an interesting speaker and I know how to engage young people and, and, and make it fun, but in part because I think there's thirst and hunger for these messages out there. So we prepare them, Diane, in a multitude of ways. You'd have to come and visit me and you'll see what I'm talking about. We, we have so many programs. It's an ecosystem that is truly diagonal. It touches every part of your life. There's no way you're gonna enter this university and graduate from this university without transformation that penetrates your mind, of course, but your heart and your soul as well. And, and you know, it would take me a while to tell you all the specific things we do, but it's unlike any other school in America. I mean, we put resources to it beyond imagination. At the same time, I wanna be sure you know, we invest enormous resources in the academic part. I want the professors to do what they do best, but I hire success coaches, every student, as a success coach, it's just like a career path. They help them through the career path. And uh, we, we really pay attention to small classes. Mentorship is big for us. Creating awareness, awareness. Why are you here? What is your purpose? And how you can change the world and all of that. I, I love what I, Diane, if they didn't pay me 20 cents a year, I'd still do this job, but don't tell anybody and make sure your <laughs> listeners didn't hear what I just said. <laughs> well, what is so beautiful is that, you know, it's, it's well known that you are one of the, you know, higher paid university, you know, presidents, but also your heart in giving back, giving back to the school and giving back uh, to, you know, so many things from the Children's Museum. There's just so many different things that fill your heart. And I completely agree with you is that the more you give to someone, the more of who they are shows up in the world. And one of the things that is unique about you is in your school that you tend to treat students like customers. And you actually talk about parking spaces and about, you know, how things were reserved for faculty and how you look at the perspective of being a student and looking at them from a customer. How is it that you do that differently? Yeah, that's your second best question. That's a great <laughs> question because you cannot run any organization, nonprofit, profit, doesn't matter, without creating appreciated value. And you cannot create appreciated value 
until you truly walk in the shoes of those people, customers, clients, partners, associates, call them whatever you want. But you cannot do what you do excellently if you don't walk in their shoes. And so I can give you many examples. When I first came here, I would come to campus at two o'clock in the morning and walk across campus. Dark, scary, I was scared. And I said, if I'm scared, that means the students are scared. So I said, we will completely change that. We will light up every square inch of this campus. I took all the trees that were all the way down to the ground. I didn't care even if that was the nature of the tree, everything was lifted up six feet. I want every student to be able to see all the way out. If there are bushes growing next to someone's dorm's window, let's say on the first floor, and you can't see the window, I cut those bushes down so that they will be view everywhere. I paid attention to everything. Mostly, the school only has two streets that were proprietary streets. Everything else was a city street, so anybody could walk through this. So I bought all the houses on both sides of every street, which later became, these were all old houses needed to be demolished anyway, but, but we built academic buildings, paid everybody a lot of money. We were very, very thoughtful about how we did it so that they could better themselves. Often we would move them or help them find a place or give them money to, to, um, you know, to transfer their belongings. And um, effectively, the streets became ours. And when they became ours, we beautified them. We put cameras everywhere. We put welcome centers that you have to come through to come to this campus. I took my security from three to 85 uh, force. And so we told the parents, this can be one of the safest campuses in America. Mm -hmm. And that was imperative. That was really important that we, that we thought that way and that we acted that way. And so the reality of it is you must walk in the shoes of the person you're trying to serve, whoever it is. When I'm coaching a CEO, I'm not talking to them about students. I'm walking in their shoes. What are their, what worries them? What is on your worry list? What is challenging you? What are the things that you're worried about? Often I'll ask people a simple question like, this is mostly CEOs, very wealthy CEOs. I'll go on a scale of one to 10, 10, you're the happiest you possibly be. One, you're the most miserable you can be. Where are you? You'd be shocked to know where people tell me a six. At a multi-billionaire, they tell me six. I go, that's a failing grade. So what we need to do is spend a little time here talking how we can get you to a nine. You don't have to be at a 10. There's always some room for misery in life. It's okay, I get it. But we gotta get you to nine. Right. I am I'm like, you know, as close to 10 as one can be. I'm probably 15 on a scale of one to 10. Um, and so when, when a leader is like that, they create energy everywhere they go. The way they walk, the way they talk, the way they make everybody feel. And then the most important thing in our business, but really it's in every business that I am, that I know the difference between an audience, an audience and a market. So when I spoke to a thousand people in an audience, let's say sales professionals, I always acknowledged there's a market there of one. That may be the senior VP of sales, maybe the CEO. But those people in the audience might buy my books and CDs for a thousand bucks, but this guy over here can sign up a million dollar deal with me. And so when I came here, I understood the same principle. The audience is the student, but the market is the parent. More often than not, it's the parent who's paying the bill. And I, I, what bothers a parent? What's on their mind? Why do they want to send their kid to a residential institution? Uh, well, you know, I mean, we all want our kids to graduate and get off of our payroll, find a job, start a business, do something productive. So I began to absolutely hone everything I say to the other person to get appreciated value. Mm -hmm. Even now, Diane, with the pandemic, we stayed open the whole time. All the schools around me shut down, we stayed open. And I thought we'd have 50% of the students come back. We actually grew by 5.6%. And that's trust. That means the parents trusted us and the students loved the place. But when you have a pandemic, you can't have parties and fraternities can't you know, have socials. And so I said, I've got to keep them interested. So I put a, I put a, a, a skating ring, ice skating ring here. They came back from the holiday. And I'm talking about a 5,000 square foot one, not a itsy bitsy kindergarten one. And it's, it's free, everything is free. And if you don't have skates, we've got them. 
And if you don't know how to skate, we've got people to teach you. And so that's a little itsy bitsy thing, but that's the way I think. I think yeah, how I, I do that. that expanded thought is is so great. And I so appreciate that you walking in somebody's shoes and seeing, you know, not many people know what it feels like at two in the morning. I mean, it reminds me when I was a, a young police officer and walking down dark alleys by myself and you notice things that other people don't notice and you start seeing that. And particularly when I did undercover assignments, you know, you're kind of invisible, but seeing the things that other people don't see. And I love how you talk about the difference of communication versus connection. And mm. what you're talking about here is that connection of asking mm. some deeper questions about what worries them, what happens with them, what that actually looks like for them. And um, I wanna share with, with our audience, you have a, a quote that uh, you mentioned a couple of years ago which I really think is uh, can speak to people's hearts right now. And it's, you know, when you have passion as a leader, others feel it and others want to emulate it. If they emulate it enough times, it becomes part of their persona and the culture evolves. Then the place commands your best. And when the place commands your best, the sky is the limit. Mm. You know, in what ways do you see yourself being your best these days? Well, first of all, you certainly have done your homework. Um, that's really terrific. I honor you for that. You know a lot of stuff about me. Um, look, I think passion is very important, but passion without action is not worthless, but close to it. Um, because you have a duty to act on your passion, whatever it is. It may be, maybe you want to be a third grade teacher. I honor that. That is just as important as the CEO of the biggest Wall Street house. Uh, so, Passion for the sake of passion, uh, you're not using the resources that you were given and you have a duty to, to put them to work in a very meaningful, productive uh, way. You know, your questions about me personally or about my work? Uh, actually both, because I think that, you know, people also see you have great success in, in your work life, but a lot of times that doesn't translate into, you know, your personal life as well. Yeah. So how do you apply some of, of those same principles? Well, um, Diane, I, I invest one third of my life in earning, right? You got to make a few bucks to, to, to buy lettuce in the grocery store. Um, I, I invest one third of my time in learning. So I am a student from the get go. I read two and a half books over the weekend. Um, and one third of my time I invest in serving. The magic is in the mix. That's the answer to your question. If, if my life was all, and take any one of those three, let's say I gave serving 90% of my time, I'd be out of whack, right? I may wake up one day, don't have enough investments, don't have enough, you know, whatever. And I have very expensive taste. And so that costs, as you know, because you look like you have very expensive days. So, you, 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 you know, you kid yourself, you got to make some money. And, but you got to learn because you can't rust on, on your laurels. And then you have to serve. Shame on us when we don't use our energy, our power, our connections to influence others like you're doing. This is what you're doing. And hopefully to impact their lives in a lasting way. Sometimes one little thing you say to someone moves them in a magical way. And, and they go all up. And I know that from the platform as you do, people whisper in my ear. I don't like it when they say, you're, you're a great speaker. Or, that was a wonderful speech. That, that's, I don't know what to do with that. But when they say, you caused me some pain today. Thank you. I know what that means. That means they're gonna, they're gonna go back and struggle how to improve, how to grow. Or, you know, when you said that, you brought within me, you know, the feeling for this, and I understand the application of that. So for me, you know, uh, uh, none of us is perfect, Diane. We're all, we're all trying to find our way, our, our way in this world. I used to think if you have billions of dollars, you got the tiger by the tail. And then I discovered that's not true. I know lots of those people who don't have the tiger by the tail. Or someone who has a family and they work day and night and ignore the family. And then they wake up one day and they have no relationship with the children and they're on their eighth marriage. And, you know, so I respect every person's choices and, and I respect every individual for who they are. Uh, but I do think there are certain principles that you teach 
that hopefully I enable others to learn, which when we follow them, we'll do better in life. And that's really where my mind is. Like, for example, leadership to me is not about position power. Leadership for me is about creating capacity in others. So if I can somehow say something today that's, that someone listens to this and it creates some capacity in them, they can go learn something, attend something, do something, build something. That's what a leader does, create capacity. The other thing a leader does is allocate resources. And people always think when I say that, I'm talking about money. Money is only one of the resources. You allocate your energy. You allocate your connections. You allocate your, 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 um, your time for sure and other things. And the magic lies there. And once we understand that inner circle and work it, life just becomes lovely. I'm a happy, joyful, joyous guy who when I have problems, I celebrate because if I had no problems, they would need me. And I don't dwell on the past. I'm always focus on the future while I appreciate the present and enjoy it and learn from the past. And that's a, that is a marked difference in a person's life. And so I'm always looking at the next project. We're finishing up right now, $170 million project, which is a basketball arena, conference center and hotel. Um, but it'll be eight months before we finish it. I'm already with the architect designing our $80 million library, which will start after that. And so, you know, I think the key is to always look forward to something, something exciting that you're going to do in life and always learn from those smarter than we are. My mother, my mom used to say to me, if you want to be great, walk hand in hand and side by side with great people. That also meant if you want to be a dingling, well, can and hand side by side with dinglings. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. And also talking, one of the things I love to ask my guests is that, you know, you obviously spend a lot of time at your campus and, you know, in your businesses. Uh, but we, how's your experience in your home? Like we have different experiences in our bedroom versus our kitchen versus our, our office or living room. Well, I'm not an expert on the bedroom part. We can talk <laughs> about the kitchen, the living room. <laughs> but what's your favorite room in your home and why? Oh, that's interesting. I live in a very large home. Um, and I say that only to make this point uh, that I spend most of my time in a small pieces of the house. So I have my little, my little cave. I won't call it man cave, but it's my little cave. And it's not big at all. It's, it's I don't know, 100 square feet. And it's got TV in it and a lazy boy armchair and so on. Of course, on. lazy boy. <laughs> yes. And I, and I um, you know, love to watch basketball, for example. I'll sit there and watch three, four hours of it. And the other place is downstairs in a large, very large, um, no, it's not the living room, but it's like a great room. But in one corner of the great room is a fireplace. And there's two nice, comfortable chairs, also recliner chairs in front of it. And that's where I spend most of the time. I like wine and I'll have a glass of wine every night. Uh, occasionally I'll drink something else, but I'm not, I'm very, you know, mild uh, drinker. And I, and I like red wine and I like to put with it some olives or some roasted nuts or whatever. That's part of the experience. So it's not just the wine I'm after. I'm after the experience of it. It's like going out to dinner, Diane, you know. Um, if you go to dinner, you're not just after the food. You're after great service and the ambiance and all that. Actually, we turn it off here, but I have four or five speakers in my ceiling and I have music all day long, oh, all day long. And it's soothing music. It's beautiful music. And so you must create your own zone. You create it with your friends, with your, who was, was it Jim Rohn who used to say, um, your salary equals, or not salary, but your income will equal the average income of the five people you spend most of your time with. Well, he wasn't just talking about money. He was saying your brain, your intelligence, your connections. So when I talk about capital, I'm not just talking about money. That's one of the capitals, but there's also educational capital reputational capital, uh, relational capital, who you hang around with and how they influence your life, and physical capital, how you take care of your body and, and all of that. So 
it's again, it's the magic is in the mix. You know that. I'm not telling anything you don't know or your listeners don't know. But, you know, people have this imagination that if someone is a really good speaker or someone is wealthy or something, they know something the rest of us don't know. <laughs> no, they just have a clear vision, a solid strategy. They employ practical systems and, and they, they um, follow up with, uh, with consistent execution. Right. That's it. There's no magic in that. That's real. <laughs> but the combination of that, Right. Terrific. Most that, of us are not, most of us are not willing to do all of that. You know that. Right. Right. And I love how you talk about the the magic is in the mix. And you know, one of the things I, I share with my clients is that you know environment is greater than willpower. So what you've created in the people you're with. That's why I ask about your know, space because a lot of times if people's space doesn't inspire them or if it's cluttered or there's all these different things that can happen, you know, it it takes them out of. Uh, either their yeah. creativity or who they want to, who they want to spend time with. Yeah. So you've mentioned several times about, you know, if you want to be the best to surround yourself with the best, mm. who is your favorite person to spend time with? Well, um, I mean, that question can be answered in many, many different ways. Right. Um, my favorite would have to be a tie among a number of people. Um, I am, I am a spiritual person, so God would be my most favorite person. I talk to God a lot. Uh, I walk, I have a place at the beach, right on the beach, and I'll walk, it's a, a private island. I mean, there are other houses on it, but it's a private island. You get a bridge through security and you get there and nobody bothers anybody. So I can walk on the beach for three, four miles, never see a soul. And I'll talk to God. I, by the way, I talk to God out loud, you know. Most of it's about gratitude and I thank God for, that which I have or came my way, but of equal importance, I thank God for the things that didn't happen to me, right? I don't have cancer. I thank God for that. I haven't had a car accident. I thank God for that. Uh, sometimes I thank God for failures. You know, I failed in this or couldn't do that. And that, that made me stronger and better and all that. Um, beyond that, I talked to my family. I'm very close with my family. I have four children and five grandchildren and a wife to whom I've been married for 43 years. Congratulations. Um, and uh, we still have a great time, you know, together and in all kinds of ways. And so, um, but I love talking to my associates here too. I have a, a cadre of executives that I talk with a lot. I, if you haven't figured it out, I am a visual person, yes, but I'm quite auditory too. So, you know, I, I, think by speaking. And if I have ideas, I like to share it with my two or three executives and I talk it out. And in talking it out, it becomes clearer to me. And then I can decide one way or the other. In my life, I've had a lot of mentors because I was in business. Mostly they were business people. Um, and of course, I have a lot of good acquaintances like Colin Powell's guy I know relatively well, for example. Um, and I can learn a lot about leadership from uh, Diane. I interviewed, you know, some of the greatest minds in America, Condoleezza Rice, others for public television here. And, and I, I don't prepare like you've prepared for this interview. I quite often will just get two or three things about them. I just let it flow and hope that I am going to have my mouth and my brain work in unison that day. Because as you know, on the platform, sometimes they do and sometimes it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually believe that that is, that's God speaking through us as well. I mean, I think there is a, you know, preparation aspect, but then there's also a presence about who you're being. And it's the same thing with schools, right? There's knowledge that you can have. And then there's also knowing and trusting that. And that's where you're building those mm. life skills and how you're, you're showing up in the world, uh, which reminds me, the motto of the university is nothing without divine guidance. Yes. And one of the things I love about our country is it's like one nation under God. Yes. How is the, you know, the aspect of, of spirituality and divine guidance, how, how is that, you know, you've shared about how you utilize it in your life. How is that uh, cultivated within the students on campus? I hope that those who are listening to you um, can uh, appreciate in you what professionalism is all about. You are the pros pro clearly. You have done your homework. I mean, you know details. You wouldn't know just casually. You put some time into it. That is, I honor you for that, Diane, because that is a that is a quality that is not very common. 
uh, and individuals like you are the ones who achieve a lot on merit and by design, not by default, not by accident. Therefore, they can repeat it again. Again, clearly you've done that in your own life and now you're helping so many others, which is what influence and impact are about. So at High Point University, we say we're a God family and country school. Now, in fairness, I don't define God for you uh, or family um, because we're an inclusive, we're a university, we're an inclusive university. However, I make it very, very clear that I believe in God and I make it very clear that I'm a patriot. You see a flag behind me, but if I turn this uh, camera around, you'll see another flag here. One on my right, one on my left. And um, uh, I'm actually looking over there at a beautiful sculpture of a kid holding the American flag as well. I have eagles all over my office and so on. And um, ironically, Diane, I don't have any of my awards here. I have tons of awards, as you can imagine. I really don't, I don't have any of them here. I have some at home, but I have awards that may be beautiful pieces of crystal, you know, or something that's, that's just, it's beauty is enough to display. Um, and, and I think that's a part of the maturation we all, we all go through. But I'm adamant about the fact that America has a lot of fallacies and a lot of blemishes in its history. However, unless you've lived in other parts of the world, you will not be able to acknowledge that in spite of all that, we are one great place. And you ought to get on your knees every day and thank God you live here and you have a citizenship here because you didn't do anything to get it really. I had to fill out 38 forms, side A and side B and promise before I became an American, and promise I'll create jobs. I'll make the country better, not worse. But my kids were just born here was given to them on a silver platter. And so quite often people don't appreciate that as much. But here at High Point, we, we make sure that our students see that. We don't lecture them, Diane. No crusades aimed at them. Partnerships with them, because that way people learn more. We, we live, they watch, they learn. Mm -hmm. I love that, so good. You know, uh, I know that our listeners are going to want to follow you and you have so many, you know, inspirational, you know, tips, whether they attend the university or they're able to follow you. How can they do that? Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, number one, of course, I have a website, uh, nidocobain.com, N-I-D-O-Q-U-B as in boy, E-I-N.com. High Point University is High Point, H-I-G-H-P-O-I-N-T dot E-D-U, not com, but E-D-U. Uh, there, if they go to the page of the president, they can watch all these um, live interviews I did with a lot of famous people on a lot of big topics. And they're really interesting to watch. These are very interesting people to talk with. Um, furthermore, they can sign up free. Everything is free. We don't charge for any of that. Um, and we don't, we don't chase you with a letter saying send contributions and all that. It's just uh, my way of just sharing, you know, what, what little we know. Um, there is something called daily motivation and you can sign up for it you know, on the website, daily motivation. And uh, every day, every morning, you get it on your email. Monday morning, like today, you get me on video. I'm speaking to you on video. Friday morning, you get me in just a quote. The rest of the week is just quotes of all kinds of people saying some stuff to inspire you, to, to, to motivate you, and to move you forward. So all of this is available. Diane, I'm not doing anymore um, a lot of these public seminars like I used. I still, I still speak, but, but mostly corporations, mostly private. And I'm not really accepting uh, a lot of coaching. I coach a lot of speakers, and a lot of CEOs in the past, uh, I'll do some, but someone has to have some significance in their business to do that. But I just, uh, A, I don't have as much time, but mostly I don't want to put the energy in that. I, I moved on to, you know, building something even bigger. And so like you, I am blessed in my life and I'm grateful for those blessings. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And we just so appreciate you sharing your wisdom and, you know, people will definitely want to, you know, pick up on those. You, you've already have so many things out for people to, to look at, to glean from. Uh, you're such a great example of how you live your life and the impact that you want to have. Uh, one of the things that we're focusing in on the show this year is being a force for good. How mm. is it that you are being a force for good in the world? 
Well, uh, I hope, I mean, I have to be humble about this because I think it's easy to answer that question in a braggadocious way. But I came to this country with nothing and I have many blessings. So I have a duty and responsibility to be a force for good. Um, let me name you three or four ways off the top of my head. Number one, I think you're a force for good by who you are, just by being, uh, bringing a smile to someone's life, saying thank you, holding the door behind you, uh, you know, helping the homeless, uh, you know, all kinds of little ways. You're not going to get any awards for it, nothing, but, but your being is a force for good when you least let someone get ahead of you in line, you know, let, don't fight the guys trying to get in the, in the lane next to you, just don't worry about it. Uh, number two, I think for me, uh, force for good means I'm president of university, but really I'm a friend to these students. If you talk to my students, you'll see that I'm their mentor. They wanna talk with me. Alumni even call me. I schedule half a day every week for students. They get two minutes of time, that's 10 minutes to ask me questions, get my guidance. I teach the freshman classes, I told you. I speak at all the open houses. So, so I believe in my connecting with people uh, with word and, and vision that I'm being a force for good. Number three, I think by being a philanthropist. Now, philanthropy is, comes from a Greek derivative, which means friend of humanity. It doesn't always mean just give money. It means be a force for good. And so I'm a, I think I'm a relatively good steward of what I have physically, uh, financially, uh, uh, mentally, intellectually, and I share it. So for example, my family and I are building this museum. It's about a $30 million children's museum in our city, something we desperately need. It's gonna be a beautiful place. Brought all these big dinosaurs and you know all this STEM, actually we call it STEAM. So it's, we add the arts in the word STEM. Um, this at Hyper University, you know, I'm probably one of the biggest benefactors to High Point University, and I'm, I'm delighted to do that. So, so money is a way that you can be a force for good. And, you know, I help build a homeless shelter in town and so on. Um, ultimately, I think we're being a force for good um, just through osmosis. In other words, if, if I do something for you, and then you do something for someone else and someone else, geometric progression takes over. And, and the force becomes forces. And eventually we plant seeds of greatness in the minds, hearts, and souls of many people. What a privilege to be in a place where you've asked me that question and how blessed I am that I'm able to answer the question, um, perhaps not in, in, in a complete manner, but, but in a manner that, that you know, encourages me in my answering you I get encouraged that I really need to focus on those words, force for good. And every day ask myself, am I being a force for good? How can I improve that in, in ways? The easiest thing to do is to give money. If you're a wealthy person, the easiest thing is to give money. But I don't think it can be forced for good by just giving money. I think you have to be an example for others. I think you have to give of your time, your energy, you know, all of your resources, being physically present and so on. Um, I chaired in my city over the years, 17 nonprofits. I was the chairman of them, not the employee, but the chairman of the board. So I, I've given a lot of energy, even when it was very expensive for me to do that. And I believe that's why I'm blessed, Diane. That's why I'm so blessed. You know, I'm, I'm 72 and I feel, uh, they, say, they say 70 is the new 50, but I remind myself also that 9 p.m. is the new midnight. You know, so, <laughs> I so, ascribe to that actually. I, love that. <laughs> I go to sleep at nine o'clock and I wake up roughly three o'clock, three o'clock to four o'clock maximum. Absolutely. Well, I so appreciate how you just pay it forward. You give on such a, a, a deep level. Uh, you know, it's not just it's time, talent and treasure. And as Mark Victor Hansen says, and thinking, you know, you're thinking about how you can expand and do things uh, bigger in the world. And uh, you just, you exemplify that in, in such a big way. So I so appreciate your time, your wisdom, your energy, being here with us and, and sharing that. So thank you so much. Diane, you're the best of the best. They need to give you your own show on Fox, CNN, on something because you're terrific at what you do. And I just wanna thank you for inviting me into your world and allowing me to be uh, 
in this circle with all of your viewers and all of your clients. Thank you for all you do, Diane. Clear to me that you are a force for good. Thank you and God bless you. Oh, thank you so much. And God bless you. And, and to our, our listeners out there, you know, we couldn't get the world out if it wasn't for you. Please share this positive messaging. We need this more in the world than ever before. So share this, subscribe, put it in your comments. You can add in uh, my name if you have any questions that you want to have um, put into uh, for Dr. Quibben as well. We want to help in any way that we can. And until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye.